Back when I reviewed the ASUS PG27UQ at the start of 2019, I was blown away, both by the experience and the price tag. Dropping two grand on a monitor, one that even a 2080 Ti struggled to supply enough frames to actually enjoy, seemed a bit mad. But now there are new GPUs, I mean, sure you can't afford any, but they do exist, and the monitors have come down in price a whole lot too. People like LG are selling their 27GN950-B for between 800 and 1000 pounds, which is still a whole lot of money, but it is literally half the price of the OG option. But what if I told you that you could get the exact same panel for just 600 pounds instead? Enter the XRGB 27 UHD. This uses the exact same LG LM270 uh, WRA-SSA1 panel as the 27GN950-B. It's the, the same 3840x2160, 144Hz nano IPS panel with a quoted 5 millisecond greater gray response time. 450 nits of peak SDR brightness, or 600 nits in HDR, a 1000 to 1 contrast ratio, and 99% coverage of the DCI-P3 spectrum. Damn, that's fancy. Now, as you might expect, those cost savings do have to come from somewhere, and that starts with the stand. It's fine, but only features tilt adjustment, not height, swivel, or rotation. Now, it does have a VESA mount, so that's not the absolute end of the world, but since most people still use the included stand, it is worth noting. On top of that, even trying to install the panel on the stand is a bit of a pain. Uh, you really need to slam it so hard that you genuinely feel you're going to punch through the panel itself just to get it to lock into place it is, it is genuinely worrying. As is kind of the rest of the build quality. I mean, it's kind of the same, it's fine, there's no major complaints, but it's a, a far cry from what I would call premium. You do get some RGB lighting on the back, it's much more tasteful than the logo projector from their 1440p model that shares the same stand and, and frame, same chassis, but it's still not the most premium. Hell, even the joystick dial to control the very basic on-screen display menu it feels rather loose and pretty, pretty cheap feeling. It's a sort of cheaper plastic for sure. And speaking of the menu, you've only got a handful of options that you will actually be interested in here, with one of the primary ones being under the picture quality setting called response time. That is effectively the overdrive settings. It has four options, off, high, middle, or low, uh, and as you'll see in a second, low is the only one I would genuinely recommend you use here. Uh, and then the other section, specifically the section actually called other, is the other place that you'll want to be heading with all of your options for things like free sync or adaptive sync to enable or disable that, HDR if you're fancy is, uh, a setting called MPRT, which is their version of backlight strobing, and you also have the nonsensical flicker-free setting, which as I uh, talked about in my last X equals review, I'll leave in the cards above for you, is very much nonsensical, it, it does not make sense as a setting to, to have that. Uh, and so yeah, I'm, I'm a little confused. I mentioned the MPRT, or Moving Picture Response Time setting, or backlight strobing among friends, which on most monitors means that the backlight gets turned off for all but one millisecond per frame to achieve the usual quoted one millisecond MPRT figure. This monitor in particular actually quotes a 0 0.8 millisecond MPRT time, which is honestly hilarious because as far as I can tell, it's false in two separate and very unusual ways. First is timing. Now, this footage was recorded at 1000 FPS, meaning each new frame is being captured one millisecond apart. 
The shutter speed is also set to 1 10,000th of a second, so it captures 0.1 milliseconds worth of light, then waits another 0.9 milliseconds before capturing another one. Let's count how many frames the image is being fully displayed. That looks like one, maybe two, two and a half? Oh, let's be kind and say two milliseconds. So it's a two millisecond MPRT, not 0.8. But the second and honestly funnier problem is that it doesn't actually clip to black. The image is still fully there, just only in red. Now, I'm not sure if this is something inherent to this style of panel, like the, the nano IPS uh, elements. I'm not, something, I'm not sure if it's something you would experience on the LG monitor that shares the same panel, as LG don't implement a feature like this, backlight strobing or black frame insertion on their monitors or on that model. But it certainly looks like they are turning off the, the green and blue subpixels but just forgot to do the same with the red subpixel, that means that the image is still being displayed, which means you could argue the MPRT time is more like the full refresh rate time of 6.9 milliseconds instead, not the 0.8 they quote. On top of that, while many of the, these backlight strobing modes often give me pretty bad headaches relatively quickly, something about this whole drop to red thing just the instant I turned the setting on, I got a blinding headache and had to, to look away instantly, only to be able to look through literally covered eyes to be able to immediately disable again, which is not a great feature to have on, you know, your, your monitor. Now, something your extra cash on the, the name brand model buys you is development time on the overdrive modes. According to Arching's review of the 27GN950, all but the maximum overdrive setting provides a, a steady decrease of the response time, generally without the side effect of bad overshoot. Sadly, on the XRGB 27 UHD, all but the low setting here have increased perceived response times and pretty horrific overshoot. As much as 95 RGB values higher than the targets, or 62%. Even the middle setting is pretty lackluster with an unpleasant amount of overshoot and still relatively long response times. Only the, the low setting offers a worthwhile performance boost without affecting the overshoot figure significantly. This is the exact sort of thing that the R&D teams will spend their time tweaking to get just right, but that doesn't seem to have been done here. And that overshoot isn't just on paper either. The UFO test shows just how bad it looks. I mean, even while gaming, it's very, very noticeable and pretty off-putting, not something that I would want to game on myself. On the low setting, the, the one that I'd actually recommend, the UFO does get fully drawn before the next frame starts, but only just, which fits with the 6.3 millisecond average response time I recorded with OSRCT. With overdrive off, you have a slightly slower response, more like 8 milliseconds on average, which is displayed in the UFO test as well, where it can't fully draw the, the UFO in time, nor can it clear the old frame in a, a good time as well, meaning you have at least an ghosted frame on the screen. Still, it's far from the, the worst panel I've seen for sure, and still relatively fast. When it comes to input lag, my time sleuth reported this at five milliseconds, which isn't all that great. Most other monitors I've tested, even 4K panels, run more like one millisecond. So again, this isn't ideal. The only catch is that the time sleuth caps out uh, outputting a 1080p 60 signal, whereas the scaler in this display is generally gonna be outputting a 4K 144 signal, to the panel, meaning the scaler will have to do some translation there. Like I said though, some other 4K panels I've tested don't have that problem, so take that with a pinch of salt. 
I also test the total system or click to photon input lag or latency, which is a much more respectable 22 millisecond average and relatively consistent. That's from clicking the mouse to seeing uh, a flash on screen from CSGO. And I use the same test system and same test setup to keep those results consistent. When it comes to actually gaming on this thing, it isn't exactly bad. I mean, it's still a rather nice 4K 144Hz panel with, in the grand scheme of things, pretty decent response times and input lag. Being a 27 inch 4K panel, the pixel density is insane, making this very, very crisp. It's plenty fluid and smooth and rather vibrant too, although I wouldn't go so far as to say it's, it's a perfect experience, especially for fast paced games. I see it as a generally good all-rounder though, I think most genres would play pretty well here. Now I mentioned the, the vibrance, that comes from the fact that this is a nano IPS panel, meaning it has a, a layer of nanoparticles on top of the LED backlight, which absorb excess wavelengths of light, meaning you can think of it as essentially cleaner light goes into the subpixels, allowing for a more accurate and wider color gamut. Specifically, it quotes 99% coverage of the DCI-P3 spectrum. Now, my Spider-X reads it at more like 97%, but the, uh, the Spider-X is only accurate or only rated for 100% of DCI-P3 coverage itself, which can make that sort of tolerance a little inaccurate. And just looking at it, I'm more than happy to agree with the spec sheet. It looks great, and actually, if you drop it to run at 120 hertz, if you're using DisplayPort anyway, uh, actually, or HDMI, because I tested both, you can get 10-bit color too. As for brightness, to the eye, it's perfectly fine. 100% is too bright for me to, to use comfortably, which is exactly what you want. Uh, it's quoted as having a, a 450 nit peak brightness in SDR, but the best that I could get was 350. And in HDR, I actually couldn't get it to do even 350, so uh, I'd take that one with a grain of salt. Uh, it isn't a massive deal for the real world, but it would put a further nail in the HDR coffin, as, uh, like I said, I got less brightness in the HDR mode, both on the monitor and in Windows, and frankly, it just looked pretty awful. It's not something that I would even consider enabling, personally. That also means that the contrast ratio is a little lackluster. I measured it at 873 to 1, uh, again a little short of the 1000 to 1 that's quoted. For content consumption, it's a pretty nice experience. It's certainly you know, a nice sight to behold, it's uh, bright enough in SDR, and again the, the 27 inch 4K pixel density makes it look incredibly sharp. Even if content creation is more your bag, I could see this being a, a decent choice, especially if you, say, edit 4K videos by day but want to game by night. Audio-wise, this does have some included sort of built-in speakers, but if I'm being honest, they're pretty naff, so unless you absolutely have to use them, I would steer clear personally. Although there is also one other sound source, uh, and that would be this. Yeah, that's an active cooling fan. It runs whenever the display is on. It's not all that loud, but as soon as my ears picked it up, especially in a quieter environment, I couldn't not notice it. The majority of people who would use this sort of display likely wouldn't have that much of an issue with it, but if you are more sensitive to constant noise like this, then you might want to steer clear. So, compared to the more expensive LG 27GN950, which is actually being replaced by the 27GP950 now, this I think is a almost a, a less refined version. The overdrive is, is generic, the, the brightness doesn't seem to match what the same panel offers on the LG model, and the physical build is definitely more budget. But I would also expect the actual experience, like the sit down and play games on it experience you know, of actually using it to be relatively similar. It's still a very nice panel, which can offer a visually stunning experience, gaming or not. So just buy one of these then, right? Well, 
there is one final thing to mention, which is the AOC U28 G2XU. That is also a 4K 144Hz IPS monitor with around the same, well, actual brightness, albeit with a slightly smaller color gamut of around 88% coverage of the DCI-P3 spectrum, but does have a faster response time, a, a nicer adjustable stand, a proper OSD or on-screen display, and controls. And the real catch is that it's currently £569 on Amazon right now, um, affiliate link in the description of course. Uh, the only thing that you uh, that might draw you to, to this X equals model instead is that this offers uh, an HDMI 2.1 port, meaning that it does support 4K 144Hz over HDMI. Strangely though, the spec sheet lists it as having one HDMI 2.1 port and one 2.0 port alongside its DisplayPort 1.4 and the USB 3 hub with uh, also a USB-C for both display in and using it as a, a KVM. But in my testing, both ports happily ran 4K 144Hz from my RX 6900 XT but wouldn't run 10-bit color, meaning that it's not the, the top-end version of HDMI 2.1. It's, it's also very strange that both seem to be able to run at 2.1 speeds, though. But anyway, that is a benefit, especially for any console owners who would prefer to try and game at 4K 120, in theory anyway. So that may sway you towards this instead. I think, on the whole, this certainly isn't bad. It definitely lacks refinement, especially in its firmware and for sure the, the build quality, but it is hard to argue with such a, a stunning panel for 25% less than what LG would sell it to you for. Personally, if I wanted a 27 or 28 inch 4K 144Hz IPS monitor, I probably would go with the AOC U28 G2 XU instead, especially with its lower price tag, although if this were more like 550 and especially if it received some development time on things like the overdrive modes, I could see myself swaying more towards this, and for sure the inclusion of HDMI 2.1, one or two ports regardless, is a great benefit. So you've heard my thoughts, but I would love to hear yours in the comments down below. What do you think of this monitor? Is it one that you'd pick up yourself? Would you rather go with the uh, sort of fancier but more refined LG one instead? Maybe the cheaper but slightly sort of less color gamut coveraged uh, AOC one? Or is 4K 144 Hz just not for you? especially if you don't have the, the graphics card for it uh, and you get something else instead? Feel free to let me know in the comments down below. If you want to check out this or pick one up yourself, I will leave a link to AWDIT, who are both the, the makers of this monitor and who sent it to me to review. That isn't an affiliate link, uh, it's just a link to them, but feel free to check out if you're interested. And I'll leave a link to both the LG and uh, the AOC ones in the description as well. Otherwise, that's kind of it. If you want to stay up to date on all of these new videos, then do hit that subscribe button and hit the bell notification icon as well. You can also support the channel in a load of different ways. Becoming a YouTube member is a great one to support directly or uh, through Patreon instead if you'd rather. Or you can pick up a hoodie or t-shirt like this one or load of other designs that I made myself. Or even just use the other affiliate links in the description if you want to support the channel and you know, you're know you otherwise you know buying from those places, that sort of stuff anyway feel free. Uh, like I said, check out some more videos on the end cards, uh, including the other X equals monitor reviews uh, if you're interested. And yeah, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you all in the next video.